Senator Bennett, I met Senator Bennett not maybe but a few weeks after you were elected in 1992. And he has been, I have admired his work and particularly his ability to reach across the aisle on, and compromise and really be a reasonable, thoughtful person talking about ideas and issues. And it's not just because it's politically popular right now to talk about bipartisan compromise. This has really been something that he's done since he was first in the Senate and really be before that when his father was in the Senate. So he's really, it's, in, it's part of his DNA. And I, I think that the, frankly, I think that the bill that he and Senator Wyden are promoting has a very good chance of being a platform for legislation that the new president will take on in 2009. Um, that said, I think that there are a few things in the bill that I see as hot buttons. Certainly, art, politics is the art of compromise. And I think it's also important, though, to look at the lessons that we've learned from the past about what really are possible compromises. And I think that the things that I have trouble with in the bill are all Senator Wyden's idea. And so uh, these are the things I'm encouraging Senator Bennett. He says he's open to conversation, so let's talk about this. Um, first of all, a, a few things that I think are absolute givens, and whoever is elected is, I think, going to be um, have these at the centerpiece of his, uh, his agenda. And, and absolutely the idea of portability. In a 21st century economy, people want control over choices. One of the reasons that we have such a high number of people without health insurance is that they're losing their, job, their health insurance when they lose and change their jobs. And that doesn't work with a mobile 21st century economy where four in 10 workers change jobs every year. So portability is really crucial. And Senator Bennett is absolutely right that the reason we don't have portability is because of the tax treatment of health insurance that locks health insurance to the workplace. If you want your share of the nearly $250 billion a year that are given in tax breaks to support job-based coverage. And in fact, we did, I think, probably the first conference on the tax treatment of health insurance that was um, given in Washington right not long after the um, Clinton care debate. And Senator Bennett was our keynote, and he wrote a, uh, an introductory chapter to a book called Empowering Healthcare Consumers Through Tax Reform. It's available on our website at galen.org, published by the University of Michigan Press. I don't know why not Minnesota. But um, it really does get down to this fundamental idea that if you're going to give people portability, you've got to unlock the, um, the, the current lock between health insurance and the workplace. And that is certainly a strength of the, the Wyden-Bennett bill, and I think it's really one of the reasons that Senator Bennett is so enthusiastic about it. The other issues, uh, coordinated care, absolutely crucial. Wellness prevention, that's on everybody's agenda. And shared responsibility, so that we look at you know, making sure that everybody that's putting money into the system right now continues to do that and that those, those resources are much more um, reasonably and responsibly used. Several of the things that I think will cause trouble politically in the Wyden-Bennett bill that I strongly encourage Senator Bennett to, to talk with Senator Wyden about, and that is starting with an individual mandate for coverage. Certainly, in order to achieve universal coverage, that is seen as, um, as one of the, the most efficient goals and mechanisms to achieve the goal of universal coverage. But I am very worried about the second and third tier results of an individual mandate. That, that means that the government needs to define what is acceptable insurance. In this bill, that is Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, standard option in the Federal Employee Health Benefit Program, which is much more generous than many people have. And one of the things that the Massachusetts plan is finding is that this not only is much more expensive than they're able to afford, but it's also showing that there are serious 
uh, shortages in the workforce. And in Massachusetts, about half of the internists are not taking new patients because their practices are filled. One woman wrote to me and she said, well, before I was uninsured and I couldn't see a doctor, now I have insurance, I'm paying for it, and I can, still can't see a doctor. So that's not a solution. We have a lot of other issues that we've got to work with to be able to address that problem. Penalties, uh, government definition of, of acceptable insurance, and the associated costs are all, I think, things that really are going to have a lot of political implications. Community rating, which means that young people are going to pay very similar, if not identical, rates to someone who's older and sicker and has higher expenses and perhaps even a higher income. But there, I think, will be a lot of pushback between um, young people who see that, that not only do they have to get into the system, but their costs are going to be higher than they would if they were, um, if they, if they were rated more according to their actual use of the system. And then finally, there is a requirement in the bill that employers are, will be required to pay um, certain percentages based upon their, um, the size of their workforce. And we have seen in a number of times in the past that what employers will see, I think, as an employer mandate will be strongly resisted. So those three things are, I think, problems that I can see why they're in the bill to achieve goals, but there may be other ways and other ideas that can be put on the table to achieve many of those same goals without some of the problems that these include. And I'll just conclude that these would include. I would include, um, conclude by, by offering a couple of ideas. And one, actually, Dr. Steve Parente is here, who's with the Carleton School, and has just written and published a really marvelous paper that explains how allowing people to purchase health insurance across state lines so that people are not confined to the rules and regulations and mandates that often drive up competition, that drive out competition and drive up prices in the state could really go a long way toward helping as many as 12 million and really more, depending upon how, the, how it's structured, more people have get health insurance without a penny of federal expenditures. So I encourage you to look at Dr. Prenti's paper he's done with uh, Roger Fellman and others who really are working hard to think about F-E-L-D-M-A-N and Parente, P-A-R-E-N-T-E. Steve, raise your hand. I'll introduce you. <laughs> and it's, it's an important paper and I think something that can go a long way toward a really cost-efficient solution. And then secondly, there is a way to get to universal coverage without the mandates, and that is by providing subsidies on a user universal basis to people to um, buy health insurance and health coverage. And if you open up the market so that subsidies, so that options are more affordable, you really can go a long way toward achieving those goals. I, um, Senator, Senator McCain likely will be talking about tonight some of his health policy initiatives that would provide this universal credit. And if you give somebody the credit, even if they decide to not buy insurance, that credit could be used to assign it to, to assign them to a health insurance policy. There, so there are other ways to achieve these goals. And I just encourage us to, to think about those and again to congratulate Senator Bennett for the really courageous work in working on a bipartisan solution, but we're going to continue to refine this, Senator, if we can. <laughs>